In June 1983, at an unknown location somewhere in Adelaide in South Australia, a frightened teenage boy cowers naked and alone in the corner of a darkened room. His ravaged and beaten body shivers in the dull light, not from the cold, but from pure fear. He can no longer remember how he came to be there or for how long. Time is irrelevant in the boy's seemingly never-ending nightmare. <coughs> Finally, darkness begins to close in on him, and soon the teenager slips away into its comforting embrace. Adelaide is just like any other Australian city in the 1970s, but as the decade draws rapidly to a close, Adelaideans are forced to come to terms with the city's dark and sinister underbelly. Reeling from the murders of several young women discovered at the tiny country town of Truro, South Australia is rocked by yet another series of shocking murders that begin in 1979. 16-year-old Alan Barnes is a typical teenager, living with his family at Salisbury in Adelaide's northern suburbs. He's good-looking, energetic and fit, and has the world at his feet. Alan was cheeky. He had an answer for everything and everybody. Uh, he had one of those quick minds and he'd come up with a quip. He had, used to keep everybody laughing. On Sunday the 17th of June, 1979, Alan is hitchhiking home after spending the night at a friend's house. Police aren't exactly certain what happens next. However, it's believed Alan was picked up on Grand Junction Road that traverses the city's northern suburbs. Alan Barnes is never seen alive again. On Monday morning, when Alan hasn't arrived home, his mother, Judy, calls police to report him missing. My children always rung to let me know if they were going to be late. So I rung the police and said, there's something wrong, you know. My boy's stabbed on his way home, but he, he hasn't reached here. Police appeal for information about the teenager's disappearance. A motorist tells them someone matching Alan's description in, in, in. got into a car containing three or four people. Exactly a week after Alan Barnes goes missing, two bushwalkers make a shocking discovery on a lonely dirt track leading to the South Para Reservoir in the Adelaide Hills. Lying beside the road under an overhead bridge, they stumble upon the contorted body of a young man. There was a report come over the television that a man in his 20s, his body had been found at the Little Para. And I was just so sure. I picked up the phone and said, it's not a man in his 20s, he's 16 years old and he's my son. And if you look on the back of his watch, there'll be an engraving that was his Christmas present. And um, not long after that, the police came and our doctor and my husband went down and identified him. It was Alan. It's Alan. A post-mortem reveals the teenager has been brutally murdered. But how he came to be where he's found is a complete mystery. Police believe that after being picked up on Grand Junction Road, Alan passed out after he was given an alcoholic drink that had been laced with sedatives. When he comes to, he's naked and still groggy from the cocktail of drugs. He lies still, confused by his surroundings and unable to move. 
Over the next week, the terrified boy is repeatedly beaten and sexually abused by an unknown number of people. He's kept sedated. However, no amount of drugs can compensate for the agony that he's forced to endure. They said that they believed he'd died on the Friday and on the Saturday night his body had been thrown over the bridge. They said that um, his body showed signs of beating and some torture and he died of a massive blood loss. But he said, they said there was a lot of signs of beating and torture. It's like ripples in a pond. Somebody drops a stone in and the ripples keep going further and further and further out. And you're drowning. You're absolutely drowning in this. There's no reality. Police believe Alan's body was washed clean after he was murdered. Also, the teenager is dressed in different clothes to those that he had on when he disappeared. Police appeal for information about the murder and a reward is announced. But despite police efforts, the investigation stalls with the detectives making no significant progress. And then, two months after the discovery of Alan Barnes's body, a second victim is found. It's Tuesday, the 28th of August, 1979, and a fisherman at a remote, disused wharf at Mutton Cove, northwest of Adelaide, makes a gruesome discovery. Snagged on the rocks, just out of the water, he finds two garbage bags stuffed with the remains of a mutilated body. Detectives are called to the scene and begin a detailed inspection of the area. The victim is identified as 25-year-old Neil Muir, who disappeared two days earlier. Neil Muir was found in, uh, in two garbage bags. He'd been uh, abused only again because of the, the, the remains, could be, that could be told, but he was very much cut up and uh, stuffed into garbage bags. It was a vicious killing and mutilation. The legs of Neil Muir had been stuffed actually into his chest cavity, so it was quite horrific. Police conduct a detailed search of the area before the bags containing the body parts are taken away for further forensic examination. Of most concern, detectives discover there are similarities between the murders of Neil Muir and Alan Barnes two months earlier. Both victims bled to death from anal injuries and ingested drugs before they died. The two bodies are dumped in or close to water and both are last seen on a Sunday. Police also believe the murder victims would most likely have been driven to the locations where their bodies were dumped. Neil Muir is a heroin user and well known to police. He disappeared the day before his body was dumped and detectives wonder if his murder may be drug related. Little is known about Neil's movements immediately before his murder. It's believed that Neil Muir has been drugged and held captive. But the post mortem reveals he's been brutally tortured. A bottle shaped instrument has been cruelly inserted into his rectum and he bleeds to death from the injury. Afterwards, his killer hacks into his spine with a saw severing his head. Neil's arms and legs are also cut off and stripped of flesh and human muscle. His internal organs are removed and placed into a plastic bag, which along with his severed limbs are then neatly stuffed into his mutilated torso. 
His head is bizarrely wired to his body and placed flat against his chest before the whole package is tightly fitted into a large garbage bag ready to be disposed of at Mutton Cove. The murders of Alan Barnes and Neil Muir send shockwaves throughout the community. Once again, the people of Adelaide begin to wonder if a group of sadistic serial killers is at large in their city. Following the murder of Neil Muir, police receive a tip-off from an anonymous caller who tells them Adelaide accountant Bevan Spencer von Einem may be responsible for Alan Barnes' death. It was believed uh, from subsequent uh, witness statements that he was uh, seen with von Einem, but uh, that couldn't be actually backed up. We're here to ask you, were you in the company of Mr Neil Muir last Saturday night? Yes, I was. But I dropped him off at a local hotel and I didn't see him after that. Uh, do you have a, know anyone that could verify that story? No. This information is filed away, along with hundreds of other leads. Well, look, thank you for your time. Uh, we may be back later to ask some more questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. More than two and a half years pass since the murders of Alan Barnes and Neil Muir, and police are no closer to solving their deaths. In February 1982, 19-year-old Mark Langley is with his family at a party, celebrating a friend's 18th birthday. His father David, his mother, and two sisters leave early. Just a few hours later, Mark Langley vanishes without trace. Mark Langley is a happy and contented young man, enjoying life to the fullest. I'm just a normal teenager. He, he liked girls. and. Uh... He, he liked uh, motor cars and motorbikes and uh, he just was a great lad. He's last seen in the early hours of Sunday, the 28th of February, walking towards the Torrens River near the city, following a minor argument with two friends. Later that morning, David Langley becomes concerned when he discovers his son hasn't come home. From about 9 o'clock, we were starting to get worried the next day. 12 o'clock, I was that worried, I went to the police. And that's not much leeway, <laughs> you know, for an 18-year-old. But uh, we knew there was something wrong. Over the following days, police conduct an extensive search in an attempt to locate him. Divers are brought in to search the Torrens River days pass and there is still no sign of Mark Langley. We were still hoping that maybe something just gone wrong, he was just injured or, or something like that. It's believed that shortly after his last sighting, Mark accepts a lift from a stranger. Hey mate, you want a lift? Hey? You want a lift? Yeah. Jump in. Thanks. Not a problem. How you doing? Not bad, how are you? Good, mate. Mark is handed a beer pulled from an esky on the back seat of the car. As the car speeds through the night, Mark Langley suddenly begins to feel drowsy. He struggles to keep his eyes open. Unknown to Mark, the beer is laced with a powerful sedative. And minutes later, the teenager passes out in the front seat of the car. Over the next 48 hours, at an unknown location, Mark Langley is kept sedated. He drifts in and out of consciousness and is subjected to a series of perverted experiments. He's violently assaulted with a bottle and bleeds to death from massive internal injuries. Nine days after Mark Langley's disappearance, his body is found in scrubland at a place called Summertown 
east of the city. Missing is his blue shirt and distinctive silver ingot chain. There are no visible injuries, his clothes are clean, and there are no bloodstains. That was very, very frightening. They, um, they said we found a body up there towards Mount Lofty Way. I, we believe it's Mark. I had to sit down and tell, tell my other daughters that their brother wasn't coming up. And that was really hard. The post-mortem conducted at the Adelaide morgue reveals something even more bizarre. There was a vertical cut into his abdomen, which was uh, actually stitched up with some thread afterwards. So it had been cut open and then re and then stitched. Police believe the killer has cut open his victim to retrieve an object that had been inserted into his intestinal tract, possibly because the item may have the killer's fingerprints on it. Animals. I, I, animal would not do that. You know, all these years I've been think, trying to think of what to call them. You do not call them men, you do not call them people, and you do not call them animals. What do you call them? And for 25 years, I could not think of a name to call them. You know, to address the press. What do I say to them? What do I call these people? They're not human. Mark Langley has been held captive and tortured for several days, just like the others. Similarly, all three had ingested alcohol and drugs. Detectives now seriously begin to consider that the same person may be responsible for all three murders. Interestingly, Bevan Spencer von Einem's name keeps cropping up, but he's just one of many persons of interest, and the alarm bells don't start ringing, not yet anyway. Police inquiries continue, and they fear there are more bodies yet to be discovered, and they reopen the case files on a number of other missing persons. 14-year-old Peter Stogneff is a talented youngster with a flair for music, living with his parents in Adelaide's northern suburbs. Well, Peter was born in Sydney. I thought he was the most beautiful baby in the whole world. The, and when my friend had a look at him and she said, oh, the, but look at his face, he's all uh, got red on his cheeks and everywhere, I said, you be quiet, he's my beautiful baby, you know. On Thursday the 27th of August 1981, Peter says goodbye to his mother and heads off to school. However, he isn't planning on attending school that day, having decided to skip classes and travel into the city to meet up with a friend. Alex Stogneff comes home from work early and finds Peter's school bag in the garage. I walked into the house, Lydia was home, and asked her, how come Peter's bag is in the garage? She said, I don't know. So he must have been planning something to do, to wag a die from school or something, because he left his, his bag in the garage. Peter had intended to go to the Rundle Mall shops, but somewhere between his home and the city, Peter Stogneff mysteriously disappears. Police investigate a report that the boy may have never made it into the city, and was in fact abducted from Tea Tree Plaza near his home. Despite numerous appeals for information about the fate of Peter Stogneff, there are no leads in the case. Then in June 1982, at a little town called Two Wells, 20 kilometres north of Adelaide, a local farmer, after conducting a burn-off, discovers a human skull, along with the blackened remains of a skeleton. Major crime squad detectives are called to the scene. Based on dental records, police believe the skeletal remains belong to 14 years old Peter Stogneff. Um, I just couldn't accept that. Why, 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 um, why they could be Peters? He's such a little boy, you know? He didn't do anything to anybody. 
A forensic examination reveals extraordinary similarities to the other victims. Where they went to, we, we can only speculate. We don't know. The back had been cut through with his saw, so his spinal cord had been cut through, and his legs had been cut through above his knees with a saw as well. Even to this day, the Stogneffs aren't completely certain that the remains found at two wells belong to Peter. I waited every minute for him to come home, every, every minute. Well, definitely we, we want the answers, desperately, yes. We would have helped to go along to uh, battle this uh, hard life, the one we have at the moment. It's always uh, in your mind that uh, we wish we would have more evidence that it is him. Till this day, I don't think it's even him. Police now have four victims, all murdered in similar circumstances. Three have shocking internal injuries, two have been dissected, and one has been operated on using surgical instruments. With the discovery of Peter Stogneff's body, the police investigation goes into overdrive. One by one, the bodies are beginning to pile up, and detectives fear there's more to come. Fifteen months go by since the discovery of Peter Stogneff, the fourth of the murdered boys, and police are no closer to solving the crimes. With the passage of time, the public's anxiety begins to diminish. Then in July 1983, the murders of Alan Barnes, Neil Muir, Mark Langley and Peter Stogneff are dramatically thrust back into the headlines. Fifteen-year-old Richard Kelvin lives with his parents Rob and Betty Ann in the trendy suburb of North Adelaide. Richard's father Rob Kelvin presents the nightly news on Channel 9. Richard is a good-looking youth who loves playing sport and has a steady girlfriend. Journalist and family friend Rex Leverington describes Richard as a normal teenager who's much loved by his parents. You know, it was, it was one of those just nice families. They all gelled. You know, you could turn around and almost say that what a perfect family they were. You know, loving parents and loving kids. On Sunday afternoon on the 5th of June, 1983, Richard is playing football with a friend at a local park. He's wearing sneakers and jeans and a Channel 9 T-shirt. For a bit of a joke, he's borrowed the studded collar from the Kelvin's family dog and he's wearing it around his neck. It's getting dark and Richard is due home for dinner. He walks a short distance from the park to nearby O'Connell Street and waves goodbye to his friend who catches a bus home. What happens next isn't exactly clear, but somewhere between the bus stop in O'Connell Street and his home in Ward Street, a distance of just 400 metres, Richard Kelvin disappears. When Richard fails to arrive home, his parents alert police. Police begin a door knock of nearby homes and businesses, and detectives from major crime are informed about Richard's disappearance. Obviously, the local detectives, Adelaide CIB, had uh, started the investigation, and then we quickly realised that something was seriously wrong. Detectives involved in the investigation of the four other murders visit Rob and Betty Ann Kelvin. It was very obvious straight away that he just hadn't run off. He was coming home for tea. He was a normal 15-year-old boy in love with a young girl and was, had, was due to go to school the next day. The police canvas of residents living near the Kelvin's home pays off.
a security guard living nearby, tells detectives he heard cries for help and car doors banging at around 6.15 on the night that Richard disappeared. Other residents provide police with similar accounts, saying they heard shouting from a group of men and a woman shortly before a car with a noisy exhaust speeds away. News of Richard's disappearance resonates around the country. Adelaide broadcaster Tony Pilkington recalls just how big the story was at the time. It would be like one of Brian Naylor's children suddenly being on the front page of the paper, having disappeared in awful circumstances. Or if you're watching the program up in Sydney, it'd be like Brian and Marty Henderson's, one of their daughters, suddenly having disappeared. So it had that sort of impact in Adelaide. The disappearance of Richard Kelvin dominates the news. Almost immediately, there's speculation that the teenager might have fallen prey to the same killers responsible for the four other unsolved murders. Police question all his family and friends, but they can't explain why he would go missing. Well, they had no idea. This is, this, this is, this is it. It was so unlike Richard to just disappear or not to ring up and say, hey, I'm over at somebody else's place and I'll be home soon. It was just not like Richard at all. Rumours sweep the city and police are inundated by calls from members of the public. It seems like everyone has a theory about what happened to Richard Kelvin. Every, everybody was out looking. People were going to clairvoyance, trying to find out something anything to see what had happened. Weeks go by and still there is no trace of Richard Kelvin and detectives now fear the worst. Resources are stretched to the limit as police investigate every lead. And then, seven weeks after Richard Kelvin mysteriously vanishes, there is a tragic development. Trevor Holmes is with his wife and children at Mount Crawford, northeast of the city, searching for moss rocks for his garden. It's bitterly cold, and he's not having a great deal of luck finding anything suitable. However, he decides to have one last look before leaving the area. As he moves further into the bushland, Trevor notices some kangaroo bones and bends down to inspect them. As he does so, he sees someone lying in the scrub in front of him. At first, he thinks the person might be injured. So I, I just edged my way over, and I went over there and I said, are you all right, mate? And I pulled the bushes right back, and then I, that's when I saw his head, and his hair was all greasy, and his skin was all mottled. I pulled further bushes out of the way, and I asked him again if he was all right. And because it, then as I pulled the bushes right out of the way, I noticed that he had a Channel 9 jumper on. So I backed off and I went up there and I said, that's Richard Kelvin. Police arrive and quickly establish that the body is that of Richard Kelvin. He's wearing the same clothes he had on when he went missing and has a dog collar around his neck. A crime scene is quickly established and police begin a meticulous search of the surrounding area. Richard uh, was in the scrub immediately adjacent to this airstrip, this dirt airstrip. So he was uh, lying on the ground in a fetal position and, uh, and uh, he'd been there probably two weeks. Bob O'Brien faces the awful task of informing Richard's parents that their son has been found murdered. It's not an easy task of a police officer and, and I don't think I did it as well as I could have, but how can you do anything like that well? It was a terrible thing. You, you look at a family that was being torn apart by something they had no control over and something you have no control over. There's nothing you can do, which is the horrific part about it, of, of watching these nice people being torn apart. The post-mortem results confirm that Richard Kelvin has been murdered in the same way as three of the other victims. Shut up! Get up! Just stay down! Just 
After being abducted near his home, Richard is driven to an unknown location. Held captive, the terrified boy is made to swallow a cocktail of powerful and stupefying drugs. As the drugs take effect, he becomes dazed and confused and loses track of time. Days turn into weeks and Richard is trapped in a seemingly never-ending nightmare. Each time the door opens, the boy cowers with fear, terrified of what's to come. Finally, Richard can take no more, and soon his ordeal comes to an end. Later, Richard's body is carefully washed to remove any traces of evidence, and he's redressed in his own clothes before being taken away and dumped in bushland at Mount Crawford, northeast of the city. People just didn't believe it was happening here in, in Adelaide. They just didn't believe it. The pathology report reveals he has a mixture of four powerful prescription drugs in his system. The following day, police conduct a further search of the area where Richard Kelvin's body was found. Police determine Richard's been murdered five weeks after he was abducted. But where has he been all that time? Newspaper reports speculate that the series of murders involve high-profile South Australian businessmen, politicians and even judges who belong to a depraved group of sexual predators. That group is dubbed the family. Oh, I think it was a, possibly a media beater. It was a hook to hang things on. You know, there's got to be a family of people. And it's just stuck. Undercover police infiltrate Adelaide's gay community. And at the same time, detectives working on the Neil Muir murder think they've made a breakthrough when an Adelaide doctor is arrested and charged. But the doctor is later acquitted and police are back to square one. Police focus their attention on the identification of fibres found attached to Richard Kelvin's clothing. The fibres are examined by forensic scientist Sandra Young. In this particular case, there were lots of tape lifts that had been made from Richard Kelvin's clothing that had been found on his body. And that included a T-shirt, a pair of jeans and a pair of underpants. A number of foreign hairs are also found. Yes, I believe there were some hairs found on the jeans, on the inside of the jeans, um, and those hairs samples were taken to the biology part of the Forensic Science Laboratory. Meantime, detectives, banking on a long shot, visit the Adelaide offices of the State Health Commission. Police are looking for a common thread and they sift through thousands of files. They concentrate on a list of people who've been prescribed restricted drugs similar to those found in Richard Kelvin's blood. It's an arduous task, but it results in a stunning development. Among the files, police discover the name Bevan Spencer von Einem. South Australian detectives investigating the horrific murder of Richard Kelvin identify a major suspect. He's Adelaide accountant Bevan Spencer von Einem. Now von Einem is catapulted to the top of the list when police discover he's been prescribed a restricted drug that's been found in the bodies of two murder victims, Richard Kelvin and Mark Langley. 
Detectives visit von Einem at his home in the northeastern Adelaide suburb of Paradise, where he lives with his mother. Police tell him they want to ask him about the prescription drugs. Mr. Von Einem, your name does appear on a list of restricted prescribed drug users. Uh, we have interviewed most of the people on that list, uh, given that your name is on it. We'd like you to accompany us down to the station for some further questioning. Sure, but I'd have to phone my solicitor and get him to meet me down there. No, that'd be fine. Police start by asking him what drugs he has in his house. I take them to help me sleep, you know, because I wouldn't sleep without taking them. That's all I have them for, help me sleep. So you wouldn't give them to anyone else? No, I wouldn't give them to anyone else because I'm using them for myself. Detectives so then decide to cut to the chase and ask him straight out if he knows anything about any of the murdered boys. I've never heard of anyone called Alan Barnes. Did you kill Alan Barnes? No, I don't know who he is. Did you kill Peter Stogneff? No, why are you asking me these questions? I, I don't know. I don't know who these people are. Do you know anybody who may have killed them? I don't know these people. I don't know what you're asking these questions for. Did you kill Mark Langley? No, I didn't. I don't know who these people are. Did you kill Richard Kelvin? No. Following the interview, Von Einem allows police to take samples no. of his blood and hair. He also agrees to let police examine his car and search his home. Mate, that bathroom's clear. Oh, no, that's fine. Good. In von Einem's bedroom, police find various drugs, including those found in the bodies of several of the victims. It's all clear there, kid. The drugs are found behind a mirror in his bedroom and in a carry bag. That's the matter. I think we've got something here. Well, well done. Keep... Oh, I'll keep it back. Yep, got some more. Yeah. There's another one here too. See, we got him. Bevan Spencer von Einem has suddenly become the prime suspect in a multiple murder investigation. But detectives know they'll need more evidence if they're to build a solid case against him. During the search of von Einem's home, police also collect fibre samples from the carpets and his bedspread to compare against the trace evidence found on Richard Kelvin's clothing. Police dig deeper into his past and discover he's been interviewed previously about an incident involving another young boy. This, this lad was taken back to a house where transvestites live. And the story was, come back to the house and we'll have a party, there's some girls there. But it was all a ruse to get the boys back there and give them a drink with drugs. They discover von Einem has close ties to a seedy group of friends who share a sick passion for young boys. Then do? police track down the anonymous caller who had first pointed the finger at von Einem. Where did von Einem go cruising for boys? Bob O'Brien interviews the witness whose name is suppressed and known only as Mr B. And how often did he do that? All the time, every weekend. Tell me about the but what Mr. B tells him is dynamite. It was Saturday after midnight, there were two guys walking down the street in North Adelaide. So you picked Some of the things he told me about what he and Von Einem were doing was quite staggering. Picking up boys and abusing them, and drugging them. Bevan always had booze in his car. He had esky in the boot and an esky on the back seat, which was always covered in clothes in case the cops pulled him over. So you picked up the boys, and what did you do then? Mr B's account of von Einem's activities sickens detectives. He tells police von Einem had a regular beat and would drive around in his car, trawling the streets, looking to pick up boys. Mr B says he and von Einem were together in his car on numerous occasions when boys were picked up and provided with drugs and also given alcohol from an esky von Einem always had on the back seat of his car. Mr B says many of the boys were taken to a house in the Adelaide suburbs and subjected to acts of extreme degradation by von Einem after they'd passed out from the drugs and alcohol they'd been given. And then Bevan went in his room and shut the door. Bevan said he'd kill him if he woke up. 
Clearly, von Einem is a sadistic sexual predator, but police still don't have enough evidence to charge him. Then, there's another major breakthrough. Sandra Young confirms trace evidence collected from von Einem's home matches that found on Richard Kelvin's body. The bedroom carpet was made of acrylic and that was a blue and an aqua. And then the hall carpet had, I think, four different fibre types in it, um, or five. Um, and they were, uh, again, acrylic with a little bit of wool. So with, and the colours were so vibrant through the microscope, so I was rather excited about it. Hair samples collected from von Einem also match those found inside Richard Kelvin's jeans. Detectives now know that Richard Kelvin has been at von Einem's home prior to his murder. Police make their move and arrest Bevan von Einem. Later that day, he's formally charged with Richard Kelvin's murder. Bevan von Einem is aware of the damning trace evidence identified by forensic investigators, and he knows he must come up with an alibi. Detectives visit him at his own request in the old Adelaide jail where he's being held on remand. And he started to say that, yes, I picked up Richard Kelvin. But soon as he said, look, I picked up Richard Kelvin, I knew he was, uh, he was in a lot of trouble in terms of a jury trial because it just the case was getting stronger and stronger against him. On October the 15th, 1984, more than a year after Richard Kelvin is murdered, Bevan Spencer von Einem appears in the South Australian Supreme Court. The trial attracts huge public interest. When von Einem is led into the courtroom, the public gallery falls silent. No one can believe the ordinary looking man standing in the dock could be responsible for such a heinous crime. As the trial continues, von Einem's explanation of how fibres from his home had been found on Richard Kelvin's body begins to unravel. I believe he um, said that at some stage he had put his arm around Richard and that would perhaps explain the cardigan fibres found on his clothing. Um, he had sat him on the floor at some stage. Um, that might explain the hall carpet fibres. If Richard had willingly gone to von Einem's home on the day he disappeared, as he suggests, then most of the trace evidence would have fallen off his clothes between then and when he was killed five weeks later. It hadn't. Therefore, the evidence suggests that Richard Kelvin was with von Einem on the day he was murdered. We were able to tell from the experiments um, that we did that uh, Bevan von Einem's um, alibi could not be believed. The jury also hears damning evidence about the stupefying drugs found in von Einem's home. Dozens of witnesses, including von Einem's elderly mother, are called to give evidence. Von Einem makes a statement from the dock declaring his innocence. On the 2nd of November, 1984, here at the Supreme Court, after a trial lasting almost three weeks, the jury retires to consider its verdict. Shortly after 7 p.m., they return. The foreman rises from his chair and says, guilty. And he sat in the box passively, no emotion, but he doesn't show any remorse. He, in my mind, doesn't feel guilty at all about his abuse of boys. I'm quite sure he sees nothing wrong with it. Justice White sentences Bevan Spencer von Einem to life imprisonment with a non-parole period of 24 years. The sentence is immediately appealed by the South Australian Attorney General. Three Supreme Court judges increase von Einem's sentence to 36 years without the possibility of parole. The sentence is the highest ever imposed on anyone in South Australia at the time. But the story doesn't end there. In 1988, almost four years after von Einem is sentenced, 
The South Australian coroner reopens the investigation into the unsolved murders of three of the other boys. His findings will set in train events that will result in yet another chapter being written about the depraved life of Bevan Spencer von Einem. Following von Einem's conviction, police re-interview secret witness Mr. B. He's granted immunity from prosecution, and in exchange, he agrees to give further evidence against von Einem in court. This convinces the South Australian Director of Public Prosecutions to allow police to charge von Einem with the murders of Alan Barnes and Mark Langley. On March the 5th, 1990, 11 years after the murder of Alan Barnes and eight years after the murder of Mark Langley, Von Einem appears in court charged with their murders. He pleads not guilty to the charges. In a stunning development, Mr B tells the court he'd seen Von Einem with Alan Barnes before the teenager went missing. The court also hears evidence that Von Einem had been in the area near the Torrens River on the same night that Mark Langley disappeared. The magistrate hearing the case finds there's sufficient evidence concerning Von Einem's alleged involvement in the murders of Alan Barnes and Mark Langley for him to stand trial in the Supreme Court. The judge agrees to admit Mr B's testimony but disallows any evidence relating to the murder of Richard Kelvin Right from the start, the prosecution's case is in trouble and the charges are withdrawn. The failed prosecution is a major blow for investigators who still believe von Einem knows more than he's ever admitted. He's certainly a very strong suspect with Muir and Stogneff, Peter Stogneff and uh, Neil Muir, and he'd have to be suspect for others as well. But trying to prove it to, and it determined, to determine whether he actually did them is a, another matter again. Meanwhile, for the relatives who were left behind to grieve, their anguish is unending. You should be back. You wait every minute, you wait every hour, you wait every day, weeks, months, years, you wait. And we're waiting till this day. I still do that. It's like a torture, but I still do it. You shouldn't play favourites with your children, but Alan was a favourite. You couldn't help but love him. He had this cheeky personality, and he always made me laugh. He always made all of us laugh. Yeah, we loved him. Yeah. I think being a father, it's my job to provide and to protect and anybody would take that away, either way. Uh, I haven't done my job, and I don't feel I've done my job. You know, because I haven't protected my children. You know, and that's the part what it really got me down a lot. You know, because of the protection so You're not a real father if you can't do that sort of thing. It's also believed that the boys' murders are not isolated incidents and that there are many others who've fallen victim to a group of sociopaths and sexual predators operating in South Australia. Without wanting to make any definitive estimates, uh, it is usually suggested that uh, the number of boys that were abducted and abused during this active period of 10 years between 73 and 83 uh, might well number in the hundreds. Police believe someone must have vital information that could hold the key to solving the boys' murders. If you do, then please call Crime Stoppers now 
on 1800 333 000. We're going to have some fun. We're going to take you for a little ride and we're going to have some fun, okay? How could one person have got a strong 15, 16 year old into the car? Get in the car. Get in there. Get in there. Get in there. There has to be more than one person involved.